in Mark chapter 3. We're continuing on in our series about the encounters Christ had with individuals in the book of Mark. And today we come to the section of the calling of the disciples. And uh, the calling of the disciples there in Mark chapter, Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 19. I'm going to read that passage here in just a moment as soon as I get everything wired up here for sound. Um, and it says, And he went up to the mountain and summoned those whom he himself had wanted. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority over the demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James. To them he gave the name Boagners, which means the sons of thunder, and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the Iscariot, who also betrayed him. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day as we continue to look in the book of Mark and see uh, your interaction, your calling people unto yourself. We thank you, Lord, that there is a call that you put out on our lives. And Lord, we see here the call that went out to the disciples, that you yourself called each one of them, that there was no mistake uh, in what you did. And Father, today we pray that not only as we would see the call in the disciples, that we would also be listening for your clear, uh, small voice in our own lives. Uh, Father, that if we have not uh, come to you, that you would be calling us, Lord, that we would hear that call, the effectual call that has gone out from your word. And Lord, that we would turn our hearts and our lives to you. We thank you, Father, as we pray now these things today. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I got to ask, are you a fickle fan or are you a faithful follower? I got to slow down when I say that or is there going to be a train crash of of stumbling there? Are you a fickle fan or are you a faithful follower? I think about different ones of you. I know uh, John Weirs is a White Sox fan. That's got to be tough, really, you know, to be a, a White Sox fan. I know Joe is a Cubs and a Rams fan. You know, it's like, I don't understand that, but nonetheless, he is, um, I guess he probably gets some of that from me. I've been a Detroit Tigers fan for oh, way too long without any results. Uh, Bill, bless his heart, you know, uh, any, anything and everything Kansas City, right? And, and he has been faithful. He's a faithful uh, follower. He's not fickle. He, he sticks with Kansas City through thick or thin. Well, Kyle Eidelman it wrote a book called Not a Fan. And he says, it may seem that there are many followers of Jesus, but if they were honestly to define the relationship they have with him, I'm not sure it would be accurate to describe them as followers. It seems to me that that there is a more suitable word to describe many in the church today. They're not followers of Christ, they're fans of Jesus. My concern is, is that many of our churches in America have gone from being sanctuaries to becoming stadiums. And every week, all the fans come to the stadium where they cheer for Jesus. They have an emotional experience, but they have no interest in truly following him through the rest of the week. One of the biggest threats to the church today are fans that call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Jesus Christ or his commands for our lives. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get the benefits, but not close enough that it requires anything from them. One of the reasons our churches can become fan factories is that we have separated the message of believe from the message of follow after me. Christ called the disciples to follow after him. Today we're going to notice here in Mark chapter 3 four important elements of Christ's calling of the disciples. The names of the 12 disciples of Jesus are listed in four different places in the Bible. Matthew chapter 10, here in Mark chapter 3, Luke chapter 6, and in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. For the most part, the names are the same, but if you read them carefully, you may find some minor differences due to variations or uses of first or maybe family names or nicknames. But they are the same 12 individuals. The Greek word for disciple means a learner, a learner, a follower. 
And early on here in Jesus' ministry, he chose 12 disciples to follow him and to become fishers of men. So as we look here this morning at Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 19, we're going to see four important elements of Christ's calling of the disciples. First of all, we see that in verse 13, Christ called his disciples to himself, to his own person. Look at verse 13 again. And he went up to the mountain and he summoned those whom he himself wanted and they came to him. Here we see again that Jesus is calling people to himself. Christ calls you to himself. Christ doesn't necessarily call you to a specific church. He will in time, obviously, but he calls you to himself. He doesn't, first of all, call you to a job. He calls you to himself. Jesus planned to call these men unto himself. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 begins by telling us that Jesus went to the mountain and the disciples were called. Now, he went up to the mountain that could be understood probably two different ways. Jesus left the area close to the Sea of Galilee and he went up to the hill country. Or two, this is a prelude to the setting of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which Mark doesn't record. Now, Luke's gospel gives us a little bit better insight into the passage. In Luke chapter 6, verses 13 through 19, we see more insights. In light of kind of the growing hostility and the facing of the need to select the twelve, Jesus goes off to the mountain and he prays by himself. In fact, he spends the entire night in prayer. And we realize why. I mean, it's the only instance, actually the only instance in the New Testament where someone spends the entire night in prayer. And as the perfect man, the Lord Jesus shows us as uh, as we men and women how we need to live in total and complete dependence on our Heavenly Father. He had some important work to do, didn't he? He was going to choose who was going to take the message, who he was going to invest his life into, And he was trying to choose who those were going to be, and he took time to pray about it. He took a lot of time to pray about it, didn't he? He spent that night in prayer. Uh, You know, when you think about the life of Christ, when he was baptized, uh, he was praying. When his popularity was increasing, the multitudes were flocking to him. The scripture tells us that Jesus would oftentimes slip away into the wilderness to be alone and pray to his father. Just prior to Peter's confession, Jesus had been praying. Uh, It was observing Jesus' praying that the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And near the end, Jesus faced the prospect of Peter's denial, his own impending suffering uh, upon the cross. And what does he do? He goes and prays. We do a lot of things in the church today. We've got a lot of programs in the church today. But I'm not so sure we pray nearly enough today. We've got all sorts of issues going on in our lives, all sorts of anxieties. We've got all sorts of needs that are in our world today, and we bemoan them, and we put them on Facebook or Instagram or whatever else, but do we take them to the Lord in prayer? We need to pray. If our Lord was so aware of his need for communion with his Father, how much more should we be? Every individual that Christ called to be a disciple He particularly, listen to this, he particularly summoned to himself. I like that word particular, by the way. He summoned those whom he himself wanted. I I was stunned earlier this week as I was reading. I was reading this passage on Monday in preparation. I began on Monday, and and I just kind of stuck on that, that, that phrase right there. He summoned those whom he himself wanted. There was not mistake one made in the selection of the disciples. Judas was no mistake. You know, Peter, with all of his issues, right? There was no mistake. There was no mistake in what Jesus was doing. Listen, there's no mistake about you either. Christ is calling you. Christ is going to save you. There's no mistake about it. You don't have to be worried, you don't have to be concerned, you don't have to wonder if you're in, you're out, you're wherever. Christ summons you, Christ calls you. You will respond. What is a summons in our modern legal terminology? Think about that, right? If you get a summons, positive or negative thing? Most likely negative, right? You don't want a summons. 
Summons is a, is a court order. It's an order to appear in court before a judge or a magistrate, and if you violate that, what happens? You are in contempt of court, right? You're in contempt. And what do they do if you're in contempt of court? They send the gendarmes out to get you, don't they? And they bring you in, or you have a warrant, a bench warrant against you, or whatever else it may be. I want you to think about this, that the sovereign of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ, summoned his disciples. I want you to consider, if, uh, if you feel as though the Lord is speaking to your heart today, and you are not a Christian, the word of God is going out to you right now. And uh, that's the outer call, and you need to respond to the inner call. God is calling you. Do not reject what he is doing. He is the sovereign of the universe. He's not some little magistrate that sits down at Johnson County Courthouse. All right? He is the king over all the universe. Friend, if Christ is calling you, you had better respond to the grace that is being offered to you. Follow Christ. Now, notice that, that next rather forceful phrase there. Whom he himself, whom he himself wanted. It's almost like, no, I, me, myself, and I, I want this, right? I want this. Jesus, we see, is a merciful Savior. He's a loving Redeemer. He's a just lawgiver. He's a merciful judge. But there are times when he demonstrates that he is the sovereign. If you are living in rebellion to the sovereign, you are living in rebellion to the great sovereign of all of the universe. Not just some little Jesus figure that we tend to put up in, you know, on our Sunday school flannel graph. He is the king over everything. He is the ruler of all. And you and I, if we don't bow our hearts and our knees to him, we are in rebellion to him. When Christ called the disciples, the disciples responded in obedience. The disciples demonstrated obedience to and compliance with the call of Christ. And it says, look at the next part of that passage, and it says, and they came to him. Christ summoned, they came. Christ called, they responded. They came to him. Those whom Christ wanted came to him. No doubt about it. No doubts. All true disciples of Christ are obedient to the call of God in their heart, period. They came to him. Matter of fact, Yet, have you, know, have you ever considered, you know, what did some of these guys have to do? Peter had a wife and children and a business. We know he had a mother-in-law, right? He had to leave and follow, as did Andrew, as did James, as did John. Matthew had a profitable business. Simon had a war to fight. A Roman to kill, you know, whatever. Each one walked away from everything in order to respond to the call of Christ. Christ may be calling you today. You may be here today as an unregenerate individual. You're not a believer in Christ yet. Uh, he's going to call you. If he calls you, he's going to call you from things. He's going to call you from being the own sovereign of your own life. He's going to call you from thinking you have to do everything in your own life. He's going to call you... From that, he's going to call you unto himself. You may be a Christian here today, and Christ may be calling you to some specific form of ministry, some uh, specific form of service. I, I, I don't know what that would be. That's for you to decide, but follow Christ. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 through 46, we see that Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like someone who finds a treasure in a field. And he hides the treasure, and then he sells all that he has so that he can sneak back right and buy that field. He finds that treasure in the field. He buries it in the field so that nobody else can see it. He runs off. He sells everything he has so he can go back and say to the person, yeah, I'll give you, you know, how much do you want for the field? Because they don't know they have the treasure in the field. But that person knows that it's so very valuable, he's willing to sell everything in order to get that field. In that same story there that continues on Christ says that the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who is looking to purchase pearls and finds one of great price and sells all that he has to do, uh, in order to own it be truthful have any of you ever you know you've been at stuff etc have you been at crowded closet or, or one of those places 
I'm not going to mention people by name, but you know who you are, right? And you've been perusing through the aisles, right? And you come across some great find. And you just can't contain yourself. You get on that cell phone. I can't believe what I found. And, and, and you pull it off. Or if you don't have the money with you, you hide it back in the, the piles and piles of clothes, don't you? You've done that. That's why you're laughing. I've done it too. I remember years ago, Joseph, and I told you already about his mental illness with the Cubs, right? And uh, he was a sophomore in high school, and Carol and I were out at Kohl's, and we found a Cubs jacket that was actually in his size. And, uh, and I hid it back deep, deep in the recesses of the clothes that were there. And I went running through the store. I said, Carol, Carol, come here. You've got you to see this. Do you think this will fit him? And so we got that Cubs coat. You know, we pulled it out. It was a great find, a great deal, a great deal. Of course, the Cubs hadn't won the World Series yet, so it was on sale, nonetheless. <laughs> well, we see in this passage, Jesus is saying, the kingdom of heaven is like someone who finds a treasure in a field. And then they go and they sell all that they have so they can have that field because they want the treasure that's in the field, right? Friend, that's what the kingdom of heaven is. That's what the kingdom of God, that's what knowing Christ is. It is worth selling everything to follow after him. It is worth forgetting and forsaking everything else in order to be in a right relationship with him. Don't let a woman, if you're a guy, keep you from the kingdom of heaven. Don't let some guy, if you're a woman, keep you from the kingdom of heaven. Here's the thing that always happens in life. Somebody gives their life to Christ and almost immediately... The devil comes along and says, here, take this, right? And it's an unregenerate guy, or it's an unregenerate girl. And the the mindset there is to take you off from what is God's best. Might even be good, but it may not be God's best. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. You find it, you stumble over it. How many of you, you were walking through your life and you kind of stumbled into, you think you kind of stumbled into the kingdom, you know? That person just by chance happened to be sitting on the bus next to you. That track just by chance was left in the train sitting there and you read it. There just happened to be a book there that somebody, there just, you happened to bounce in to run into somebody in the mall. The person came to you, just happened to come. There are no happenstances. Go back to what it says here in the scripture. He summoned those whom he himself wanted. If he wants you, he sends those things along your your way. That's not a happenstance. It wasn't chance. It wasn't by luck or whatever else. If Christ is calling you today, come to him. What's a disciple? A disciple's a pupil. A disciple's a student. A disciple's someone who learns from the Bible. Yeah, yeah, that's the case. But it's not just somebody that has philosophical or theological knowledge, which those are important, but it is somebody who has spent time and spends time with the master, too. Spends time with the master. Jim and Jill's son-in-law is flying planes in the jungles in, uh, in Indonesia. And I am sure that, you know, had they taken uh, his instructor at Moody, had they taken him and said, here's the book, study it. He takes the test after studying it for a few months, and they give him the keys to the Cessna and say, take her up, you're you're ready. Uh, I wouldn't volunteer to ride along with him, would you? Not at that case. But what they do is they take him up with a pilot. A master pilot goes up, and they take him up, and he spends time, and he flies, and he learns how to take off. He learns how to land. He learns all those types of things along the way. You spend time. There's theoretical knowledge, but you have to spend time with the master. Christ calls us to spend time with him. Christ calls those whom he particularly wanted to be his disciples, we see here. Look at verse 14. We move on to the next point. Christ appointed the disciples with a plan. Look at verse 14. And he appointed 12, that they might be with him, that they might send them, that he might send them out to preach. When Christ called the disciples, he called them to be an intricate part of a sovereign plan that he had. It is Christ who appointed this ragtag band of misfits 
to be the heralds of the message of salvation. Think about that. Appointed it means to construct. Uh, it means to constitute. It means to ordain. Uh, it, it may mean to endow a person with an ability to do something. Up to this point, the 12 were kind of friends of our Lord, loosely defined disciples, but now something changes the intensity of the relationship and they become something greater than just their own individual parts. They now become a band, a team, a body with a purpose to proclaim Christ. You see, the church isn't just about individuals. It's about we've got a greater purpose involved. And that's to be the, the unified body of Christ, presenting Christ uh, to a, a community around us that so desperately needs him. Last football season, you know, the Hawks looked really good, and then they took that really bad slump. And you found out really quickly who were faithful followers and who were fickle fans, right? I mean, the, 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 have, have you ever listened to the call-in show? You know, the Coach's Corner call-in show and listen. I mean, it's interesting, the calls that come in when, when they're winning. And then Kirk Ferentz is the dumbest man on earth the next week when they lose. Yeah? He's probably one of the smartest football coaches ever. You know, fantastic. One of the highest winning percent, percentages ever. But we get so fickle. We lose one game. We get fickle. We forget 20 years without a win or without a winning season, right? We get fickle. Jesus used a strategy to turn fickle fans into faithful followers. Look at, look at verse 14. He appointed the 12, whom he also called the apostles. The word appointed means to make, which shows that his plan was to mold and make us into messengers. Messengers, heralds of the gospel, heralds of the truth. The plan was twofold. The plan was to develop a relationship with Christ because it says there, so that they would be with him. Christ calls you and me to be with him. Not just in eternity, but in preparation for eternity here and now. Jesus was intimately involved in training of the 12. Robert Coleman, who uh, wrote some really uh, important books, Christian books, you know, 30, 30, maybe 40 years ago now, Master Plan of Evangelism, Master Plan of Discipleship. He studied the early church and how the early church grew. And one of the, the points that just came out in Master Plan of Discipleship that he wrote about was in order to be a disciple, you got to be with Christ. Seems pretty elementary, doesn't it? But it's pretty true, and it's pretty important, isn't it? If you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you've got to spend time with Christ. Uh, if Christ is going to be our Lord, if Christ is going to be the one who, who we say that we are living to serve, we probably ought to spend some time with him. And probably more than just Sunday morning only. We probably need to spend time with him during the week, reading his word, spending time with him in prayer. What causes us to lose that priority in our lives. It can be good things, right? Newspapers, TV programs. can be bad things, newspapers, TV programs. It can be, it can be whatever that we allow to get us off of our off of focus of Christ. We're not called to be apostles. That office is closed. We are called by Jesus to be, though, with him. We are with him continually. Why? Because his spirit now lives within us. You know, that's why we can pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean you have to sit in your house for, you know, umpteen hours at a time. It means you can pray as you're going to the street, you know, down the street. It means you can pray when you're at work. You can pray when that atheist professor at the university is telling you you can't pray. You can pray just to spite him. <laughs> right? Pray that God would smack them upside the head or whatever. You can pray at all times, in all places. We can develop that relationship with him. So, so he called that we would be with him. We're with him. Now let me say this. You know, do you have a time a day that you try to spend with the Lord? And I'm not going to be legalistic. I'm not going to say you have to do it every single day, but 
If you've got a really good friend, I mean, if you've got a really good friend, don't you like being with your friend? Talking with your friend, hanging out with your friend, doing things with your friend. That's the way we should look at this. God's plan is that we be before we do. All too often, and we in the ministry especially, gospel ministry, are oftentimes more are guilty of trying to do instead of be. But we should be before we do. Be with Christ. Before we worry what we're supposed to do for Christ. Think about all the ministry opportunities all the disciples had with Jesus. Feeding the hungry, healing the sick, casting out demons, preaching the gospel, traveling here in their active ministry. Do you know why they had an active ministry? Because they were where Christ wanted them to be. They were with Christ. Being with Christ naturally reveals what Christ wants us to do. If we're not with Christ, if we're not walking with Christ, we have a harder time figuring out what Christ wants us to do, right? It's just kind of simple that way. The plan, the second part of the plan, was to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ. The words there might send them out to preach. Might send, might send is actually apostello, which is from which we get kind of the word apostle. It means to be sent out on a mission. Christ called the men out of their previous lives. He was calling them to a new life of service in the kingdom. He was sending them out, and the mission was to preach. I get really sick and tired of hearing nowadays in our more modern wing of the evangelical church that, you know, the day and time of preaching is over. You know, let's have discussions. Let's have, you know, community groups. Let's have interaction about these things. Let's have a lot more music than focus on the word and blah, 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 blah. All those things can be fine and okay in their place, but... God ordained the foolishness of preaching to share the message of the gospel. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have a a responsibility to share Christ on the bus tomorrow. If God brings a a, a non-Christian that's next to you on the bus or at your school tomorrow, then you should share Christ with them. Don't say, well, he wasn't in church, so pastor didn't get to preach at him. You share the gospel. You preach the gospel. We should all preach the gospel every single day. You know that? Starting with ourselves. I don't do it successfully every day because some days I don't even know where I am until I've already drank, you know, the first half a cup of coffee. You can ask my kids. That's really true. I just kind of stumble out there with a glass in hand, you know, with a cup in hand. But I try, for the last couple of years, I've been trying, before I even get out of bed, to just say, you know, you are a filthy, rotten sinner who has been saved by a wonderful, glorious God. And it just kind of lets you know, you know, hey, that's some pretty good news. That's better than the Folgers in my cup, right? It's way more important to know that, to be reminded of that. Preach the gospel to yourself. If you're down and discouraged, That's good news. It's good news we need to remind ourselves of every day. Friend, we live in an increasingly evil world. The church is faced with questions on what to do, and there are essentially only four responses that we have to do. We can isolate ourselves. They did it throughout all church history. There have been groups that have isolated themselves to monasteries and other locations, you know. Our own forefathers came from England. They wanted to get away from the corruption. Yeah, I, I laugh too, think about what, what it became here. We can insulate ourselves. We can try to insulate ourselves from the problems and the pain and life and all around us, but that's really nearly impossible to do. We'll probably end up with an us versus them mentality if we do that. God doesn't want that. We can imitate the world, which is far, far, far too often the case in American Christianity. Imitate the world. See how close we can get to the world. See how edgy we can appear to be as we try to buy the Kool-Aid and drink the Kool-Aid of the world. We try to swear like the world because it seems cool for preachers to swear today. We drink like the world because that seems cool. We watch the same things. We sleep around like the world does today. When Christ is calling us to a holy lifestyle, 
We can also, though, infiltrate this world. And that's what Jesus wants. Break down barriers, build bridges to those who don't yet know Christ, proclaim the gospel to those who are lost. Christ had a plan for the disciples. He still does for disciples today. Third, Christ empowered the disciples for a purpose. Look at verse 15. To have authority and to cast out demons. To have authority. Christ had a purpose to endue the disciples with spiritual authority. And if you are in Christ, you also have spiritual authority. It is an authority that has been given to you, that's been an imputed because of the righteousness of Christ has been imputed into you. The word there, authority, exousia, this word actually combines the ideas of might and right. In our world in which we live, it seems as though far too many people have might that really don't have right. It's wrong what they're doing. It's morally wrong what they're doing. But they've got the might to do it. Sometimes those who have the right do not have the power of might to force compliance or guarantee acceptance. The word for authority seems to combine both of those ideas perfectly. Jesus Christ gave his disciples both the right and the might to fulfill what he had called them to do. This is a distinctly spiritual authority that Christ has given us, has given to his disciples. And You know, I am reminded that whenever we are in the presence of Christ and whenever we go and proclaim the message of Christ, Satan and his demons are there to oppose you say, well, Chris, that, that's like when you've been in Haiti and that's when you've been over in you know, other... No, it's not. It's right here. It's here, too. There's spiritual battles that are being fought right around us. Look at what it goes on. Christ qualifies those whom he calls. It's easy to think we're not worthy of such a, call, a calling. The truth is, you're not. The truth is, I'm certainly not. However, Jesus qualifies us to be successful. He qualifies you. He qualifies you. I like how one pastor put it. He said, Jacob was a cheater. Not you, Jacob, but Jacob. Moses was a killer. Abraham was old, too old and a liar. Peter had a terrible temper. David had an affair and and conspired for murder. Noah got drunk. Jonah ran from God. Paul was a murderer. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossip, Martha was a warrior, Thomas was a doubter, Sarah was impatient, Elijah was depressive, Lazarus was dead. (laughs) God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Are you called? Do you have a past? Of course you do. We all do. Use it for God's glory. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is to remember all of his old, nasty past. That's not what it says. He's a new creature. The old things have passed away. The new new has come. Fourth and finally, Christ called ordinary people. Called ordinary people. Look at verses 16 through 19. And he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James. To them he gave the name Boagners, which means sons of thunder. And Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and uh, Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. In this list of disciples, we see strikingly ordinary men. Do you realize that? Strikingly ordinary men. These are the men you see at the shop tomorrow. These are the men you see at Walmart tonight. These are the men that you see in the classroom tomorrow. These are the men and the women that you, you, know, you work next to, wherever. In this list of disciples, we see strikingly ordinary men. Christ calls ordinary people to perform extraordinary tasks. I know that some of you, I know some of you kids two summers ago read the, uh, the lives of many of the great missionaries. And uh, Amy Carmichael was a, was a great 
uh, Northern Irish missionary. She was born in Malisle, but was, uh, was raised in, the Bel in Belfast. Um, I have been uh, to the, the mission where she, she worked there amongst the linen factory workers. Um, she wasn't the type of person that the world would have gone crazy over. She wasn't anything extraordinary. She was the oldest of seven kids. Her dad died when she was 18. The family was impoverished. She went and lived with another family because her family was so poor. Um, she worked for a few years sensing a, a call of God. And, and as I said, this, this mission there in Belfast wasn't wonderfully successful. Nothing impressive in that sense. She wanted to join the China Inland Mission, Hudson Taylor, right? He rejected her. Said she wasn't healthy enough to go. Physically frail. And so she went and she did a short term in Ceylon then, Sri Lanka. She did a short term in Japan on that same tour. But nothing overwhelmingly successful and went back to Britain. And then God opened a door for her to go to India. And you know, she served the Lord in amazing ways in India, rescuing thousands of children out of the debauched temple prostitution that their fallen wicked religion taught. And she stood there in the gap for, I think, 42 years without ever even taking a furlough. You know, when 42 years without a furlough. Uh, the last 20 years of her ministry, she served as a near total invalid because of a severe fall that she'd had. They called her mama. Thousands of children called her mama. You know, she, she did something extraordinary. Because she was an extraordinary person, right? No, because she served an extraordinary God. She's just an ordinary Irish woman that, that served an extraordinary God. Who were these men? What did they do? What did their obedience cost them? Maybe if you're considering discipleship, you need to think about it. Simon Peter, Petros, Rock. His Hebrew name was Simon. He was the brother of Andrew. His occupation was fisherman. He was the most prominent disciple in the early church. And tradition tells us that he was crucified upside down in Rome in the middle 60s. John. John means God is gracious. The son of Zebedee, brother of James. Occupation, fisherman, early church bishop. Only disciple to die a natural death after they tried to boil him alive. James, Greek, Andreas meaning manly, uh, son of Zebedee, brother of John, occupation, fisherman, put to death by Herod Agrippus, Agrippa. Uh, about 11 years after the death of Christ. Andrew, the English word for Jacob, meaning Israel, or he who supplants his brother. Brother of Simon, disciple of John, occupation, fisherman. Preached in Russia, Turkey, and in Greece where he was crucified. Philip, Philippos, means lover of horses. Maybe you had a gambling problem, I don't know. Was from Bethsaida, city of Andrew and Peter. Occupation, probably fisherman. Was in Galilee when Jesus found him. Preached in North Africa and Asia Minor. Put to death by the proconsul after leading the proconsul's wife to Christ. Bartholomew means son of Talmai, king of Geshur, possibly of royal blood. Many scholars believe that Bartholomew is also known as Nathaniel, a friend of Philip's occupation unknown. Was in Galilee when he met Jesus. Tradition says he was a missionary to Armenia where he was there killed. Thomas from the Aramaic, Teoma, meaning twin. He's best known for doubting the resurrection of Christ. He preaches in Syria and all the way to India where he would be speared to death by soldiers but where the oldest church still bears his name, the Martoma Church. Matthew, Levi, uh, meaning gift of Yahweh, was also called Levi. Occupation, we studied him a couple weeks ago. Public and tax collector, preached in Iran and Ethiopia where he was there stabbed to death. James, son of Alphaeus, preached in Syria, was stoned and then clubbed to death to make sure that he was dead. Thaddeus, also known as Jude, the son of James, 
whose surname was Thaddeus, uh, Judas, not Iscariot. His occupation, unknown, martyred in Persia, modern-day Iran. Simon the Zealot, called Zelotes, occupation, freedom fighter, guerrilla, whatever you want to call him, whichever side you're on, right? One person's freedom fighter is another person's guerrilla. Preached in Persia and Iran where he was stoned to death for not worshiping some sun god. Judas Iscariot is from the Hebrew word Ishkariath, uh, meaning a man from Kiriath. Occupation, possibly businessman or finance, best known for betraying our Lord. And he takes his own life. Nobody extraordinary in that group, really. Maybe one. Christ is calling ordinary people today. He's calling you. Imagine, I just went through those guys, the, the disciples' kind of lives, work histories, you might say. Think about what the resumes of the 12 disciples would have sounded like to a research firm, a hiring firm, headhunters, you know, for work. Dear sir, they're writing to Jesus. Dear sir, most of your nominees are lacking in background education and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprises you are undertaking, Right? They do not have the team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience and managerial ability and proven of capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no leadership qualities. The two brothers, James and John, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel that it's our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, definitely have radical leanings. You might want to examine their Facebook profiles. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He's a man of ability and resourcefulness, has a keen business mind, and has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We would recommend Judas Iscariot as your comptroller and right-hand man. All the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new adventure. Wow. Right? God could care less if you're extraordinary because he's an extraordinary God. He takes the weak things and he infuses his strength into the weak things to make ordinary people perform extraordinary tasks. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word today, and I pray, Lord, that you would be using your word to call us unto yourself. Father, we pray that if there are those here today who don't know you, who are questioning, who are seriously seeking, Lord, uh, we pray, Father, that your word would be speaking to their heart of their great need for you. There are those who are here today, Lord, who feel that you are calling them to something, We pray that they may also seek after you, that you would reveal yourself to them. Father, we praise you for your word today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. After the service, and we're going to, Pastor Richard's going to come up and we're going to partake of communion together, but there are those who are here today that God is speaking to your heart. You feel like God might be drawing you either into a relationship with him or for something specifically. Um, There's going to be a pastor in the in the library following the service today. Instead of having something rushed up here, we'd like you to take time, if that's what God is calling you today, too. Uh, After the service is over, go find the quietness of the library. You can talk to a pastor there, and he will talk to you about either how you can know Christ or uh, if there's something specifically in your life that you're needing to pray about and seek after Christ. Pastor Richard, will you come forward?